Come on in. All right. All right. So let's just, uh, are, we, are we rolling? OK, welcome back. Um, so just to refresh where we left off. So in the last uh, section, we talked some about how to think about um, research ethics. And we talked about rules, principles, and ethical frameworks. And it's none of these are really specific enough to help you deal with the problems that you're likely to encounter in practice. But they can help guide each of those things. And so in this section, uh, I'll talk about four problems that I see occurring frequently. Many of you have probably had these problems or heard, have friends who had these problems. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how those principles and frameworks help inform decisions about these topics. So those four areas are informed consent, which we've already talked about, uh, informational risk, privacy, and making decisions in the face of uncertainty. And these themes will come up again in the case studies that we'll deal with this afternoon. Um, so the way I'm going to structure this is I'll give you a simple idea. That is, I think many people have this idea about this particular problem. And then I'll try to give you a counterexample. And then I'll try to give you a better way of thinking about it. So I'm going to try to break down maybe some of your intuition about this. And then I'm going to try to rebuild it in a different way. Uh, so that's the structure I'll take with each of these four examples. So informed consent. Um, so the simple idea that many people have is that informed consent is required from all participants. Uh, let me give you uh, a counterexample. So this is a paper by my former colleague, Diva Pager. It's a lovely paper. Uh, it's called The Mark of a Criminal Record. And in this paper, what she does is she hires actors to go and apply for jobs. And she gives these actors fictitious resumes, some of which uh, show a criminal record, and some of which do not show a criminal record. So in this particular paper, and this is a widely well-loved uh, paper in sociology. And um, this is an experiment without consent. Who are the participants here? They are the employers. They did not consent to participate in this experiment. Um, so it turns out that uh, this is not the only version of this kind of field experiment. So there have been these kinds of experiments to study discrimination in the labor market, at least 117 studies in 17 countries. So it's not just Diva Pager that did an experiment without consent. I should also say she is one of the loveliest people. And so I think that also adds to why I picked this as an example. Um, so uh, lots of people have done experiments without consent. And they've done it in many countries. So they don't follow this simple rule, consent for every experiment. So what is something different about this that where there are other things that may counterbalance this desire for informed consent? So the people who do this kind of research have made the following argument that says that sort of uh, lack of informed consent is appropriate in this setting for four reasons. So the first is that there is limited harm to the employers. So they're not dramatically harmed by this. There is great social benefit from having reliable measures of discrimination. The weakness of other methods in measuring discrimination. So here, uh, let me just reiterate, in the context of Diva Pager's study, she wanted to understand whether people with a criminal record were being discriminated against in the labor market. You could imagine trying to do that by getting a bunch of observational data. Uh, and you might find that people with criminal records have lower employment rates and lower wages than people without criminal rate records. But then you would naturally think, well, there are important differences between people with a criminal record and people without a criminal record. And you could try to adjust for those statistically. But that's not likely to be a super compelling estimate. Whereas doing this kind of field experiment allows you to make a pretty convincing estimate, at least for this particular place and this particular time. Uh, so the weaknesses of the other methods. And then this fourth one is the fact that deception does not <clears throat> violate the norms of that setting. So this I want to talk about a little bit more. So the, there is a concern, and a lot of times in experiments, about a possible harm to context. So for example, if you went to the doctor uh, 
and your doctor did an experiment on you without telling you, that would potentially create a big breach of trust in an area where we as a society have decided like people should be able to trust their doctors. This is like a protected space. So this is part of the reason we have laws about if you go to a psychiatrist, those records are protected in certain ways. Uh, uh, there are a bunch of situations where we have said like these are protected spaces that are, um, should get extra uh, sort of protection, for lack of a better word. And they argue that employment application is not one of those settings and that there already are routinely people who misrepresent themselves in these settings. And so this is not a huge violation of this context. Employers are already aware that there may be people who are misrepresenting themselves. So for these four reasons, these experiments are appropriate. So notice, th this is like a well thought out argument. This is not like, oh, I didn't feel like getting consent from these people. Right? This is actually quite well thought out. Um, there's also a rules-based argument that you could use. So dozens of IRBs have approved this, uh, most likely based on this particular part of the common rule, which has specific conditions under which consent can be waived. <clears throat> there's also a legal basis for this. So US courts have supported the lack of consent and use of deception in field experiments to measure discrimination. This is the actual court case. Uh, this court. Um, this was a measure, I think, of housing discrimination, field experiment to measure housing discrimination. And this court made many of the similar arguments that the researchers made here. So the simple idea is informed consent for everything. And the more complicated idea is some form of consent for most research, which is, again, not super helpful, right? <laughs> because when should you have consent? What form of consent should you have? At what time? So um, when thinking through informed consent, I think one thing that's helpful to keep in mind is, is informed consent motivated by respect for persons or beneficence? So often we think informed consent is motivated by a respect for the autonomy of people, but it is also sometimes for the protection of those people. So in Encore, for example, this is the one where internet censorship measurements were being made with people's computers. So people who knew that they were at risk of being, let's say, monitored by the government or in a place where this thing was particularly dangerous, they might want to not consent, not for respect for persons reasons, but also for a beneficence reason. And so if you can't get informed consent from someone, you should try to think about are there, there's respect for persons reasons you should get consent and also beneficence reasons. And some of those beneficence reasons you can potentially address without getting consent. So you could, for example, prevent people that you think are at higher risk, or you could do other things like that. Um, so try to do as much of you, as you can of the work of informed consent, if, even if you can't get it from that particular person. Uh, there are a number of alternatives that I talk about in the book. You can go and read them. There's the idea, we, some of them came up in this hand washing example. You can potentially get consent from third parties. You can do a bunch of, you can make the, the, uh, a, the fact that this experiment is happening public so that people could opt out if they want. A lot of these are much worse than informed consent from the person. And a lot of these were used in some of these ethical, uh, unethical studies have a long history of using very uh, other forms of consent. So these are viewed as kind of gray areas. But in a lot of the situations that exist today, informed consent from all participants, I think, is very, very, very difficult. And so we're going to have to develop more of these other forms of consent. There already have been things that are developed, and they're described more here. Uh, OK, so that's issue number one. Issue number two is information risk. Uh, OK, we have about 15 more minutes, and then I'll to do these last three, and then I'll talk a little bit to set up the activity, and then we'll break for lunch. All right, so second problem that comes up a lot is information risk. So what is informational risk? So it's the, in like medical research, there's a risk to people of them like dying if you do something to them, right? And in a lot of computational social science, there's no risk of people dying. Uh, the biggest risk is usually 
risk that information about these people becomes available in a way that they causes them harm. So we often call this informational risk. And this could be economic. Uh, so you could lose your job if certain things, like certain parts of your behavior become public. You could, it could be, lead to social stigmatization and embarrassment. It could lead to psychological problems, or it could lead to criminal problems. Um, and so how should we think about informational risk? How do we keep people's information safe and avoid it from getting out where it can cause them harm? So the simple idea, I think, is that data can be made anonymous, and we can tell what data is sensitive and what is not sensitive. So I think everyone kind of agrees, if the data is sensitive, then we need extra protection. So that requires us to be able to know what is sensitive and what is not sensitive. And then I think there's a belief, if we take off all the PII, personally identifying information, then the data is safe. And I think both of these ideas are wrong. Um, so let me give you an example of a failure of anonymization. So this is from a study by Latanya Sweeney. Um, so what uh, happened was the state of Massachusetts uh, wanted to, they had a bunch of medical record, insurance records that they wanted to make available to researchers. So they wanted to help researchers do better research about health. Their intentions were very good. Um, this was the information that was in the original record. They then removed certain information. So they anonymized it. And I put that in quotes because they didn't really anonymize it. Uh, so they took off people's name and so on. Then what happened was that there was outside records from voting data that contained many of the same fields that were in the medical records. And then you can do a merge. And then you've connected the identifying information to the medical information. And so most re-identification attacks, so we're going to use the term from computer security where you think about someone who is out there who wants to do something bad to you. We're going to imagine an adversary, an attacker. How are they going to attack the data that we think we've de-identified? They're going to try to find some other information. And then they're going to try to merge these two things together to bring together the identifying information and the other information that we were trying to keep separate from any identifiers. So I like to think of like a physical analogy. So like baking soda by itself is safe, and vinegar by itself is safe. But when you put them both together, you get this baking soda volcano. Um, you, you've all done that in science class, right? And so let's go back to the Latanya Sweeney thing. So these records by themselves were safe. These records by themselves were safe, but when you put them together, you have the problem. And so one of the biggest challenges with de-identification and re-identification attacks is that you need to be protected against every data source that exists in the world today and forever in the future. So if you have your baking soda, you may say, there is no known chemical that mixes with baking soda and causes a volcano. You'd be wrong in this case. But let's say that was you have some other thing, baking powder. And let's say there's no known chemical that mixes with baking powder to cause a volcano. But then five years from now, some new chemical gets created, and that mixes with the baking powder to cause a volcano. So in the information setting, more and more information is being exposed and dumped into the world. There's this big Equifax leak. Equifax is a big credit rating agency in the US. There are likely to be more enormous data breaches. And so as those things get out there more and more, there's more and more stuff that people can use to attach onto the data that you think you've de-identified. Um, the second part of this is about sensitive and what's not sensitive. So one, um, uh, this is a, an, a paper that involved the attack of the Netflix data. So you all know the Netflix prize. So Netflix released a bunch of movie data, and people used it to uh, try to predict what movies people would like. And um, they, Netflix removed all personally identifying information, but the movie rating data by itself was potentially identifiable if you attach the right external information. So this is the paper describing that attack. Um, and then you might think, well, that's OK. Like, it's just your movie ratings. Like, what's the big deal? 
And for me, for example, yeah, my movie ratings, not a big deal. But that's not true for everyone. Uh, and so when this data got re-identified, there was a lawsuit that includes this line. Um, so movie and rating data contain information of a more personal and sensitive nature. The members' movie data exposes a Netflix member's personal interests and our struggles with various highly personal issues, including sexuality, mental illness, recovery from alcoholism, and victimization from rape, uh, uh, incest, physical abuse, domestic violence, adultery, and rape. So for many people, their movie rating data is not sensitive. But for some people, it is sensitive. And so if you have an enormous database, there is likely to be something in there that is sensitive to someone. right? It's, even if the probability that anyone's movie rating data is very sensitive is low, Maybe it's like a 1 in 100 event, or a 1 in 1,000 event, or even a 1 in 10,000 event. Um, if the database is big enough, those people are going to be in there. And so it's very hard to know what is sensitive ahead of time. And so uh, it's very hard. So the, the better idea here is that all data are potentially identifiable, and all data are potentially sensitive. And so what is then what do you do? So I think the best way to think about this is having an appropriate data protection plan. And so I really like this plan, the, this framework that came out of people in the UK called the five safes. So you want safe projects. Like you want to be doing things that are safe. You don't want to be doing things that are dangerous. Uh, you want safe people so you can control who has access to the data. You want safe data so you want to store the data in the most de-identified form possible. You want safe settings, so you want physical control over where this research is taking place. And you want safe outputs. You want to produce things that are not going to accidentally leak information. And so I think these five safes are a great way to organize a data protection plan. So data protection plans are very important for yourself. Uh, you don't want your data to get out unintentionally. <clears throat> and they're also very important if you're looking to collaborate with someone else. So if you go to a company. And you say to them, oh, I'd really like to use your data. They're going to be worried about what is going to happen to the data. And so if you go to them and you say, I understand that you are worried about what is going to happen to this data. Here's my data protection plan. It's based on this five safes principles. And here's what I'm doing. And here's, can we talk about this? It's lots and lots of stuff can be done safely if people are just aware of what needs to happen and are diligent about how to do it. So I think this is very important for you, for yourself, and as you want to form partnerships with other organizations to get data access. Um, so I think with strong data protection plans, uh, most computational social science is minimal risk. And so there are more ideas about data protection in, the, in bit by bit. I want to say one thing about what minimal risk means. So this is a very important idea that um, means there's nothing that is risk free. So like, even for you to come here to this summer institute, there's risks. Like you got on an airplane. Maybe you took a cab to get here. You walked from your dorm here, and a tree could have fallen on you. Right? There is no, nothing that is free of risk. And a lot of these very small risks are very, very hard to quantify. Like, is it that tree falling on us? Is that like a one in a million thing, or a one in a billion thing, or a one in a trillion? I don't even, it's hard to know. And so for research ethics, we often have this benchmark, minimal risk, <clears throat> which should be called kind of everyday risk. So is what you're doing riskier than the kinds of things people choose to do every day? And if it is not riskier than that, then that it means sort of we should think about that kind of research differently from research that sort of adds risks to the kinds of things that people do. OK? Privacy. Um, so this is another thing that I, I had that some naive ideas about um, when I was working on the book. I thought, oh, I'll just like read, find the definition of privacy and just write down that for everyone. And it turns out it's a very confusing concept. What is privacy? What does it mean? Um, but it's definitely something that comes up a lot in computational social science. Are we violating people's privacy? So what is privacy? I'm not going to say whatever is cool. <laughs> uh, uh, privacy is very hard to define. 
I am not going to try to define it. What I am going to give you is an idea for how to think about privacy that I think makes clear um, a little bit about how, helps me think about whether I think something is violating someone's privacy or not. So the simple idea people have about privacy is this public-private dichotomy. So if the information is public, then you can do whatever you want. And if the information is private, then you can't do anything. I think that is not the right way to think about privacy because there's lots of ways that you can violate people's privacy with information that is currently public. Um, so this paper, for example, um, they wanted to study the effects of uh, possible um, pr pride and shame on people's voting behavior. And so they said voting records are public. This is true in the US. It's re recorded whether you voted or not, and anyone can go and have access to this. So these research, this researcher took out an advertisement in the newspaper and said, I'm going to publish in the newspaper who voted and who didn't vote. And the idea is that this would trigger potentially shame and change people's voting behavior, voting turnout. So this uh, is an example of taking information that is public and doing something with it that many people would find surprising. So if I told you, for example, I came down here the day before the workshop started, and I went over to the courthouse in Durham, and I pulled the voting behavior of all of the TAs uh, and Chris, and now I'm going to show it to you on the screen, Like that would be a little weird. That would be me doing something a little strange. And I could say, well, that's all public. No big deal, right? Can I put up your voting records? Uh, so I think what makes that weird and what makes this thing weird uh, with this threatening to make this public information more public, uh, this idea of contextual integrity by Helen Nissenbaum really helps clarify what's going on here. And that rather than thinking about public and private information, we should think about the flow of information. And what, vi what people don't like, what violates respect for persons, is when information moves in a way that people don't expect. So she argues that there are three ways to think about these. So the important idea in her work is context relative information norms. These are sort of the norms that people have about the way information is going to move. And so she thinks it's important to think about who are the actors, like who is sending, who is receiving this information, what type of information it is, and under what uh, rules this information flows. So if your doctor, for example, has information about your, um, let's say, some of your, some disease that you have, and your doctor shares that information with a drug company, if that is being done for marketing purposes, you might find that to be inappropriate. And if that was being done for research purposes, you might find that to be more appropriate. So here, even if the same piece of information is flowing between the same two people, the reason that it's flowing is different, and that changes how people think about it. So for lots of questions about information flow, going back to these three dimensions, diagramming out what's happening will help you realize even why sometimes the identical piece of information moving can sometimes feel like a privacy violation and sometimes not. Uh, and then the fourth and final issue is making decisions in the face of uncertainty. So we all have a lot of things that we are potentially doing, and we don't really know what to do. And we don't know there, what kinds of harms these things could do. So it's very difficult. And sometimes people might say, well, the, we should be better safe than sorry. So if there's any possibility of harm, let's just not do it. So this is sometimes called the precautionary principle. And I think this is, though, um, something that can be potentially problematic and taken to an unnecessary extreme. So, in, so let's imagine an experiment kind of like emotional contagion. Um, you could say someone might have been harmed by this experiment, so we shouldn't do it. Um, but it's also true that people might be harmed if they don't do it. So it's possible that this would lead to knowledge that would be helpful to the platform improving itself. And so there is no risk-free approach, just like there's no risk-free approach to life. There are risks to doing studies, and then there are risks to not doing studies as well. And so you have to think also about the risks that come from not doing the research. And this helps get away from the idea that there is this safe way of being, because there is no safe way. <laughs>
There are risks to all things. And so then you have to think about what are the balances of these risks on both sides. So I think there is no risk-free approach, and we should not take a narrow field of view. We have to remember that there are benefits that can come from this research. There's a much longer elaboration in this book by Sunstein about how we move beyond the precautionary principle. I certainly don't have time to do it right now, but read that book. It's good. So what are the ways forward? Um, the minimal risk standard I talked about already. So if someone says, oh, someone might be harmed, you can say, great, but how does this compare to their everyday level of risk? That helps bring this risk into context. Uh, power analysis helps you decide um, how many people need to be in your study for it to be effective. Um, and so if it turns out that you would need an enormous number of people to detect an effect that you think is meaningful, that may be a sign that this is not a great thing that you want to be doing. Helps you deal with the uncertainty by getting some numbers around what you'll be able to measure with how many people exposed to the treatment. Um, you can do surveys of people before you do your study to get a sense of how they'll react to different variations. So in Bit by Bit, there's a link to a paper that uh, describes this surveying process. I think it helps. Um, if you're uncomfortable or unsure, getting feedback from other people is good. And getting feedback from people who are very different from you is even better. And so these ethical response surveys can be good for that. And the last is idea is a staged trial. So in, a, like in the drug trials, they don't just jump right away to stage three trials on humans. Right? They, first do, they first do something on animals. Then they do a separate thing to find a safe dose. And if only then do they get to the final thing. And so if you have a study and you're worried about whether it's safe or not safe, don't just jump right to the full thing. Start with something much simpler. So like in Encore, they could have rolled out a version of it in a place where there's little internet censorship, just to make sure everything is working smoothly. And then they can, if that works OK, they could try rolling it out in one smaller place, which then they would be able to observe it more carefully, and so on. So don't, if you're worried, just take a staged approach. There's more ideas in bit by bit. So those are four areas of difficulty, uh, informed consent, informational risk, privacy, making decisions in the face of uncertainty. Uh, are there any questions? OK, so um, the bit by bit also has some practical advice, and I want to talk about that briefly now. The IRB is not the end. The IRB is the floor, not the ceiling. You know more than the IRB knows about what you're doing. So you can, you're in a position to make your research better. Um, it's very important to think about everyone else and how they will react, not just how you would react if you were in their shoes. So I often hear researchers say, well, if someone did that to me, that would be totally fine. And I feel like, yes, but you are not like everyone else. So try to imagine how everyone else would feel and react. And that's an important part of the process as well. Uh, and think of research ethics as continuous and not discrete. And this is something you'll get practice with in the afternoon. Uh, don't say, oh, that's unethical or that's ethical. Say, how could this be more ethical? Like, how can we move along this continuum? Because I think the, this sort of discrete way of thinking, it, it makes us, it's like an easy way out of thinking about these hard things. And so if we think of it more as continuous, we realize that everyone could be getting better in what they're doing. Um, and then also, think of ethics as an opportunity um, to do a new area of research. So often we think of ethics as being something that constrains what we can do. But I think particularly in machine learning now, there's a lot of research about fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. This is not all totally motivated by ethics, but it's related to ethics. And so there they have this you know, research They've turned this ethical issue into a research challenge, and there's a lot of exciting research happening in this field now. And I think in social science as well, we can start to think of ethics as a research opportunity. So now methodologists are doing work to make estimates, let's say, more cheaply or more accurately. And I think we'll increasingly see people trying to make estimates more ethically. So I think there's a number of interesting methodological problems that we can work on. So now uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce the case study approach that we'll use. And then we'll break for lunch.
and then we'll do the case studies together in the afternoon. Um, One second. Mm, no, we won't. OK, so I'll just, I, it's, I think it's frozen. OK, so let me tell you what we're going to do next. Um, so the goals of the group activity are, one, for you all to get to know each other a little bit better. So this is a good thing about the group activities. Um, we want to give you practice looking at research and helping to think about the ethical dimensions and then give you practice communicating about those ethical dimensions and potentially developing other approaches that you would take to go forward in these situations. So you'll read about two case studies. One is a study that happened and was published and we'll read the paper. And the second is a sort of a story about a study that didn't happen. The researchers had access to some data and they thought about the ethics and they decided they didn't want to do it. And so you'll get a chance to discuss both of those. There are questions um, that go along with each of these case studies. So after lunch, we'll split up into groups of about four to six, and we'll do that randomly. Then you'll get one of the case studies. You'll discuss it in your group for about 45 minutes. Then we'll all come back together and have a discussion about it, uh, because our guess is that each group will identify different things. It will be important to hear what the other groups say. Then we will split up again, do the second case study. You'll discuss it for about 45 minutes. Then we'll come back together and have a group discussion. Uh, then we'll have a short break. And then we'll have the guest speaker, uh, Duncan Watts. So uh, there, are there any other questions or logistical issues before we break for lunch? Oh, yeah, are there any questions about what we did or what we're going to do next? Cool. OK, so um, Elsie from Helsinki, sorry if I completely butchered that pronunciation, asks um, about your thoughts on data protection. So would you plead against open data in social science, or can we safely share data that we have gotten consent for and or pseudo-anonymized data? Yeah, it's a big, um, it's a big, big question. I am I'm, um, I'm personally very much in favor of open data. Um, that's something that we'll talk about a little bit in the second week. So for example, if you do projects here, we will encourage you to make the data available. We will encourage you to make the code available. Um, so how to handle making data available. Um, so I think the, the five safe model is good. So I think the model of making the data anonymous and posting it online, I think that is a, it's a hard thing to do now for lots of data. Not all data, but a lot of data. Um, and so I think increasingly we'll see some models that combine an application process with some kind, uh, so that you can be a little bit more sure who is using the data uh, and how they're using it and set some rules for how they can use it. Uh, in the longer term, there's a very active area of research in computer science and statistics now about differential privacy. So different ways that people can make queries to the data without revealing any information about any individual person. Because if you think about it, most of what researchers are interested in is broad patterns, not what any one person is doing. And so it should be possible to somehow make information about these broad patterns available without making the individual information available. And so there, that is a technical problem that some people are working on. Uh, my sense is that's not currently ready to deploy at wide scale, but maybe in the future. And I think also we'll increasingly see more of a hosted model where um, you can, for example, have someone log into your machine and uh, like a, uh, then they can work with the data on your machine, but they can't take the data off of that machine. So this will be hard for an individual researcher but companies or governments or universities can potentially create these remote access data enclaves um, that would be able to make this data available in a um, 
slightly more protected way. Any more questions? So Anna from NYU asks about the minimal risk standard. Mm -hmm. um, so what about at-risk populations who lead dangerous lives? So their everyday risk is very different than ours. Is it justifiable to shift standards to their risk? Or should there be a baseline, like privileged college students? And, or where should that baseline be? That's a great question. And there's actually a couple of papers about that. Um, and the general consensus is that you want to use a general population standard. So you don't want to say, for example, oh, those people are homeless, so they're already at a lot of risk, so we can do more dangerous research with them. You definitely don't want to do that. Um, so then there's difficulties in actually defining the general population standard, because obviously people are exposed to different amounts of risk and so on. So I think like. If you pick like the median risk in a society or the mean risk or something, you don't want to necessarily expose people who are at more risk to even more risk. Um, and there are papers in Bit by Bit that I have references to that deal with that issue very explicitly. Um, one issue place where this comes up a lot is on um, experiments on people on social media platforms. So one argument that came up about emotional contagion uh, some people said, oh, you're exposing these people to more risk by ex making their news feeds more negative. Uh, and other people said, well, they're already exposed to stuff in their news feed that's potentially n much worse than what's happening here. Um, and so one way to think about that, uh, as far as I know, this calculation has never been made public, uh, or maybe it's never been done. But to look at the sort of naturally occurring variation in the emotional valence of people's news feeds, and then see to what extent the treatment that these researchers did move things outside of the sort of naturally occurring range. And so if you say, you know, people's news feeds on Facebook are usually in this range, and we were moving here, that would be different and then if they were like moving like way outside of the normal range. So that's another way to think about. So then the question is, should you baseline the minimal risk to other people on Facebook or other people in society? And so I think there is an argument to be made that using a platform like Facebook, which does not include every single person in the world, that would be a reasonable standard for evaluating what is minimal risk for an experiment on that platform. Matt, I'm just going to interrupt you and yeah. say we're over time. And I'd just like to thank Matt for a great, great series of lectures on ethics. And we will reconvene at 1.30 to do the group exercise. And we're going to cut the live stream. Thanks. Thank you.